Hi, this is Francisco from the History of D&D Instagram account, and you're listening to Tale of the Manticore. The following podcast is intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to Tale of the Manticore, Season 2. Like the creature from which it takes its name, Tale of the Manticore is a mashup, a crossbreeding between two different species of storytelling. Here, you will find the unpredictability of old-school RPG paper and dice games with the storycraft of a dark fantasy novel. No character is sacred, and no character will be spared if the dice decide their fate is at hand. According to lore, the tale of a manticore is barbed with cruel iron spikes. There will be much pain in the days ahead. Last time on Tale of the Manticore. The last chapter begins with a huge party at the Pale Horse Tavern. Yellowfly and his companions are celebrated as the heroes of Napule following their successful defeat of Lord Goddard and his men and the subsequent dismantling of the Silmarillion authority in that city. While the PCs are enjoying themselves, Krell, in Whitestone Castle, experiences the worst night of his life, and in a sense, the last night of his life. He's visited by the apparition of Azor Azul, who, displeased with Krell's refusal to bring new prisoners to the dungeon, turns him into a Yeth Hound by way of punishment. Krell is not killed in the transformation. No, his is a fate far worse than death. Now he exists as a tortured thing, a damned creature caught between two worlds. The chapter ends with a piece of Bazu's backstory. We learn that, about a decade ago, he had his heart broken and his life turned upside down when his father used him as a pawn in his games of business and enterprise. Disgusted by greed and disillusioned by those he thought were closest to him, Bazu gave up his fortune and turned to a life of wisdom, poverty, and faith. Chapter 56 Part 1 The Last Days of Winter Party Status Several weeks of rest and healing have restored the PCs to their respective maximum hit points. Yellowfly 30 of 30 hit points Shawnee 20 of 26 Jace 37 of 37. Catsbane, 17 of 17 hit points. Bazu, 16 of 16. Spells available. Catsbane has memorized Magic Missile times 2, Invisibility, and Mirror Image. Bazu has prayed for Cure Light Wounds times 2, Bless, and No Alignment. The first few days of the newly born city-state felt like a strange mixture of work, celebration, and apprehension. The latter was tempered by the knowledge that word of the revolution would take two days just to reach Blackmire, and at least four more for Colfrey's forces in Westmire to respond. If they were to respond with force, it would take even longer, while troops and supplies were procured and organized. And if Colfrey had truly taken ill, as he was purported to have, it was anybody's guess as to what would happen. Still, there was some measure of peace in knowing that nothing could happen right away. There was also advantage, and Bromley's free league grasped it with both hands, spending the precious time fortifying the city in preparation for a siege. In a sense, they'd been preparing for years, and had long maintained secret stores of both weapons and provisions in caches scattered throughout Napule. Bromley had even ordered his engineers to build a pair of ballisti, the parts of which had likewise been hidden here and there beneath the notice of the Silmarillion Authority. Now, as the potential day of reckoning arrived, these had been unearthed, assembled, and mounted atop the short towers flanking the east gate. The companions had been busy as well. Yellowfly and Jace spent their days in training. Yellowfly did much, but not all, of the instruction. Jace had a few tricks of his own to share. Shawnee helped the men and women of the Free League to create an archery range, and could most often be found there, practicing with her short bow. Occasionally, she gave some casual instruction to new archers, but mostly she trained on her own after things were up and running. Catsbane continued to work through the arcane books Shrawl had given him, and he had a breakthrough one day when he devised a way to reverse his new spell, Haste, in order to force time to slow down. 
Through experimentation, he further discovered that he could combine a portion of this reversed incantation with parts of two other spells, Mirror Image and Magic Missile, and, in this way, multiply the number of arcane bolts he could summon. Thus, he increased the potency of a relatively simple evocation. During this calm before the storm, little was seen of Bazu. The strong-minded cleric had sequestered himself among the members of the Church of Sadal, which was a very small order of not more than a dozen members. Together, they prayed for the safety of their brothers and sisters of the Church of the Sacred Flame, who, by all indications, were still held captive in the dungeons under Whitestone Castle. On the evening that the moon waxed to its fullest, Bazu returned to the potter studio and rejoined his companions. Together, the five of them walked to the lake shore, and, as the moonlight danced atop gently lapping waves, Bazu underwent the ritual of induction into the Church Thieves Guild. Yellowfly conducted the ceremony as he had with Catsbane, handing Bazu a slip of paper with his name written across it. The cleric had already pricked his finger with a knife he had sharpened, as was the custom. He blotted his blood on the paper, and then Jace traded him a lit candle for the knife. Shawnee's smile and Catsbane's nod indicated that it was time to say the oath, and so Bazu said the words they had all once said and bound himself to his companions, forever in brotherhood. In the silence of the night, and under the light of the stars and splendor of the full moon, with Sadal and Shatroon as my witnesses, I make this oath, that I shall no longer be judged by other men, that I shall instead judge myself. I further pledge to uphold the secrecy of the Church, even at the cost of my own life. Now I burn away my old life. When it is gone, I am reborn. Although Bazu has just passed another milestone in his life, we now turn our attention to Yellowfly, who I have criminally neglected, no pun intended. I thought he was set to achieve level 6 today, but looking back at my records, it appears I somehow skipped a level up due to him back in episode 46. That means I haven't advanced him since episode 37. Oh dear. This is the kind of oversight that gets characters killed, and if I'm being honest, it isn't the first error I've made in my bookkeeping this season. When I think of how Fly almost lost his life to Sir Salomar, I really need to sharpen up and pay better attention. I guess in the end, no harm no foul, and it means I need to do a double level up right now, taking Fly from 5th level all the way to where he should be at level 7. Well, let's get into it. For additional hit points, Yellowfly will get 2d8 with the usual min-out rules applied. Rolling. I got a 5 and a 4, so that's 9 added to his current score of 30 for a new maximum of 39 hit points. On to stat increases. I'll roll 2d6 for each stat. Strength. I see a 6. 15 goes to 16. No mechanical change here. He remains at plus 1. Intelligence. A 4 and a 1. How about wisdom? A 5 and a 4. Rolling for dexterity. I got a 1 and a 5. A bonus to constitution is always nice for a fighter. No, I've got a 2 and a 1. And lastly, charisma. A ah, 4 and a 3. Hmm, that's a little disappointing. I think the dice gods must be punishing me for my carelessness. Still in all, with his proficiency bonus and strength, Yellowfly now gets a plus 6 to attack, and that's before taking into account the plus 2 bonus from the Silverthorn's enchantment. All said, though I'm a bit disappointed in myself, Fly is doing just fine. Chapter 56 Part 2 The Last Days of Winter Party Status The party status is unchanged, with the exception of Yellowfly, who has a new hit point maximum of 39. The icicles that overhung the potter's studio door and pointed down like dragon's teeth receded, week by week. Winter in Nepule was in retreat, slowly giving way to verdant spring. The songbirds returned to their nests, though the trees were yet leafless and sported only little green buds. The snow dwindled and eventually disappeared, exposing a still frozen earth that resisted men's shovels. Before long, the air became sweet with the smell of pollen and occupied with the manic aerial stuns of flies and the laconic heavy droning of bees alike. Little by little, the vibrant chlorophyll green of vegetation replaced the whites, grays, and browns of winter. Several weeks had passed since Bazu swearing into the church's thieves guild. Each one had carried hope and anxiety in equal measure for the men and women of Nepule, who listened for, but heard, no thunder of drums, no blaring of horns. The monarch's vengeance they expected simply did not come. 
This encouraged Nepulix as they toiled to construct basic defenses. Carpenters added hoardings of timber to the turrets that flanked the east gate, right under the newly erected ballistae. Blacksmiths worked together to forge a stout portcullis, which they installed behind a wooden portal already reinforced with a heavy bar of timber. Now even a battering ram would have trouble getting through. While neither time nor season permitted the digging of a moat, a feature that otherwise would have made a great deal of sense given Nepal's access to Blue Heron Lake, workers were able to dig a shallow trench around the city, into which timber stakes with fire-hardened points were placed so that they leaned forward at a 45-degree angle. This simple construction would deter a cavalry charge from the enemy if they ever came. While work continued atop and outside the walls, within, men and women trained alike in the use of spear, sword, and especially the bow. Boyers and Fletchers were busy during these last weeks of winter, laboring tirelessly to produce the weapons that would be Nepal's primary defense. The city was abuzz with industry and apprehension, but also with hope. All this time, the captured former watchmen were released from their various detention places at a rate of two per day. Bromley had slightly misspoken when he had told the companions that these men would have their thumbs broken. It was the pinky, not the thumb, that was so injured as the price of their freedom. A few of these Silmarillions fled west to Camranth, but most followed the road east to Westmire and beyond to the capital. It was during the fifth week after their declaration of independence, while the vestiges of winter still remained, that the new portcullis on the east gate was raised and opened to admit Shrawl. By his side was the woman who guarded him, and whose name the companions had never learned. They had assumed that she had gone west to Camranth, and he east to Zesha, but they were wrong on both counts. Other agents had been sent to those two neighboring kingdoms. Shrawl had, in fact, traveled east, but Silmoral had been his destination, he having wanted to observe the capital's reaction firsthand. Having done so, the owner of the pale horse had quite a lot to report. My first stop on the way to Silmoral was Black Creek. We stopped there on our way here, said Yellowfly. Thought maybe you had. There's a rumor there about a particular thug who was cut down by a man wielding a silver sword. Would you have to know anything about that? The sly smile on Shrawl's face matched his flippant tone, but Yellowfly merely shrugged with his features impassive. Shrawl continued. I stopped by the inn where this fight supposedly took place. There I spoke with the owner, but he denied having any knowledge of the matter, so I guess it's just a rumor. I guess so, agreed Yellowfly. Shawnee, nearby, rubbed the back of her neck, and Jace wiped his nose with his sleeve. From Black Creek I made for Westmire. I wanted to see first hand if the soldiers there were making ready. Were they? No, not really. News from Nepule had reached them, so there was some agitation, but not enough to make me think any orders had been given. Furthermore, there was no calling of reserves, nor attempts to conscript men from the surrounding area. I think they're waiting for instructions. That's good news for now, if they have no real leadership, but could eventually be dangerous in the long term. Eventually, someone will step in. After that, you went to Silmoral, I suppose, prompted Yellowfly. I did, yes. Are the south gates not still closed, then? They are closed. Traffic in and out of the capital is more tightly controlled than ever, in fact. How did you get in? asked Shane. I have a way in and out that I can share with you. He might have saved us some serious bother had he shared it back when we had the jester along with us, said Shane peevishly. I didn't know I could trust you back then, Shane. Things are different now, came the prompt reply. Who's running things in Silmoral? asked Yellowfly to get the conversation back on track. Has Gulfrey been seen? Our former king has not been seen at all. There was a man named Krell. Ah, I see you've heard of him. He has also gone missing, apparently, and now a Sergeant Koch leads the City Watch. He stepped in after a week of general lawlessness and has restored order under a rod of iron. Yellowfly sneered minutely at the mention of Koch's name, but said nothing further. There's more. Whitestone Castle has been abandoned and locked up. The Cernon gates have likewise been shut and are guarded by eight men-at-arms at all times. Strange, said Shane. Why would they do that? This time it was Shrawl who shrugged. More rumors, and these ones are harder to credit. Eerie wailing sounds coming from within the castle walls in the middle of the night. Lots of people missing, too. My informant says Koch sent in first one, then a second scouting party to investigate. Neither returned. Clearly there's something bad going on. That's why they have not responded to your revolt, suggested Shane. Shrawl nodded. It would seem so, yes. But what of the imprisoned clerics of the Church of the Sacred Flame? Bazu had been listening quietly this whole time, but his patience had run out now. What news of Sister Araness and the others? There is no news, said Shrawl with a sigh. And the church is still closed as far as I know. 
Ministers of Grace defend us. Can they still be in the dungeon under Whitestone? If they yet live, I think that is the most likely thing, yes. Actually, I was going to ask you if you would be willing to go back to Simoral and find out. Yellowfly touched his beard, preparing to give the matter some thought, but Bazu answered for everyone. Of course we'll go. When do we leave? Hi, we're the Rolled Standard. We're a tabletop role-playing game actual play podcast that plays and reviews games, and over the last three years and 150 episodes, we've played games such as Call of Cthulhu, Numenera, Lycoma, Merc Borg, Pirate Borg, Mothership, Kids on Bikes, Frontier Scum, Merc Borg, Starfinder, Bossin, Mutant Crawl Classics, Monster of the Week, Viking Death Squad, and Merc Borg. New episodes every other Friday, and on the off Fridays, our sister show, Flail to the Face, where we play nothing but Merkborg. Surprise, surprise. So swing through for fun, friends, and chaos. And remember, don't sniff glue. Merkborg. Chapter 56, Part 3, Day 180, the first day of spring, early morning. Party status. Several weeks of rest and healing have restored the PCs to their respective maximum hit points. Yellowfly, 39 of 39 hit points. Sean A, 26 of 26. Jace, 37 of 37. Catsbane, 17 of 17. Bazu, 16 of 16. Spells available. Catsbane has memorized Magic Missile times two. Invisibility, Mirror Image, Infravision, and Haste. Bazu has prayed for Cure Light Wounds times two, Silence 15 foot radius, and Bless. The stony beaches and guano covered rocks of the Nepulic coastline were behind them. Now, their little bark slid past the clusters of bulrushes and the stinking bogs that marked the northern edge of Black Creek. Young Torum let the current carry them, or work the oars when necessary. Torum was one of Shrawl's men, and also a friend of Zeb's, the cook at the Laughing Maiden Inn, to whom the boat belonged. Zeb had said he would have taken them himself, but his back was not as strong as it used to be, and Torum, with his muscular and compact frame, would make a fine pilot. Since the boat only permitted room for the five companions, their gear, and one other, Zeb had stayed behind. Torum proved to be less of a historian than Zeb, but he was tireless of arm and good company, despite an annoying fondness for ribald humor. What's long and thin, covered in skin, bred in parts, and gets put in tarts? He asked with a knavish grin. Yellowfly idly pulled at one of the buckles on his new suit of armor. The others had insisted he keep Sir Salomar's fine-scale mail when Shrawl had presented it to the group. Well, I know what you want me to say, but I'll not say it in this, uh, fine company. So, what is it then? Rhubarb. <laughs> Yellowfly laughed, despite himself. You must know a thousand such riddles, Torum. Probably more. Care for another? Not especially fond of this kind of humor, Bazu cleared his throat and pointed at the coastline. <clears throat> uh, look there. That one must be a male. Impressive. I'd say he's at least three feet tall. The cleric was referring to a heron with plumage of light gray and a spot at the throat colored bright blue. It flapped its wings at them as though in salutation from its place nearby a pill-shaped stone and then turned its attention back to the water, looking for a meal. How much longer will it be, do you think? Torum considered. They were moving faster than they would have on foot, but slower than would be possible on horseback. Say, a day and a half? Then another half day from there on foot to the capital, added Yellowfly. On foot? Why not approach from the cliffs? asked Shane. She had been mostly quiet during the ride. We won't be able to get close enough by boat. Where Whitestone Cliff meets the water, there's too many sharp shoals. Extremely dangerous to bring a boat through there. I'll make the last part of the trip on foot, but fear not, I know the way. Want to hear another joke? The butt of Night Mother's gnarled staff splashed a muddy line across her little scrying pool. As the spell expired, the wobbling image of six people in a boat was replaced by a dark brown smear and the stink of algae. There were three of them standing in front of the crone's hut in the swamps near Mirpool. A raven on the roof cawed a hoarse complaint, ruffled its feathers, and caught again. Silverthorn is on the move. 
This time you must fail me not, nor you. Near the muddy pool, a bullfrog, with weird human-like intelligence in its bulbous eyes, burped and hopped away from the three cloaked figures. Nightmother was addressing both Romola and the red-haired wizard together. Serodioth had stayed with them throughout the winter, using the sanctuary of the swamp and studying under the witch's tutelage. Nightmother regarded her longtime pupil, Romola. The web of wrinkles about her eyes creased in concern. Then she handed something over. Romola took the object and tucked it into her bag with a wordless nod of thanks. This is all I have to give you. If you cannot win this time, we may not try again. Mark me, son and daughter. You must kill the cleric. Romola and Suro the Mad have teamed up to accomplish what they could not manage individually, and Nightmother has used the last of her power to aid them, both with her scrying spell, which turned a boggy puddle into a kind of temporary crystal ball, and with a gift, whatever that is, she handed to Romola. I'm not being coy, by the way. I have no idea what she gave her. I'll figure that out later. Since NPCs level up at the same rate as PCs in Tale of the Manticore, these two villains have increased in power since we last saw them. I keep a chart where I track NPC passive accumulation of experience, and I can see that Romola achieved level 8 in episode 53. I can also see that Suro will get to level 8 in the next episode, so I think it makes sense to update Romola's character sheet now and wait until next time to do Suro's. Okay, we looked at Romola's stats in episode 38 when she hit level 6, so I need to bump her up 2 levels. That's 2d4 for new hit points. I've got a pair of threes. Romola continues her hot streak for hit points and goes up to a very impressive 29. I said it before about her and I'll say it again. That is just ridiculously high for a magic user. Of course, she's going to get new spells too. She already knows the following. Auditory Illusion, Glamour, Improved Phantasmal Force, Blur, Paralyzation, and Suggestion. I need to add one first level spell one second, and two fourth level spells to this list for a total of ten spells. I'm going to roll all this stuff off mic. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back and she has gotten the following spells. Detect Illusion at first level. Whispering Wind at second and at fourth level. Rainbow Pattern and Veil of Abandonment. If you're scratching your head and wondering where I'm getting these spells, they're from the Old School Essentials Advanced Player's Tome. I suppose Detect Illusion speaks for itself, but what are these other spells all about? Well, here's what they do in brief. Whispering Wind. This allows the caster to whisper a short Twitter-length message that will travel, in Romola's case, up to eight miles away. This is really just a utility spell. Rainbow Pattern is a bit more complicated and considerably more dangerous. It basically allows the caster to enthrall a large number of creatures at once and then cause them to stand there, just staring at the lights swirling around her. Finally, the less ominous than you might think, Veil of Abandonment. This spell is basically a really strong illusion that makes a place look abandoned. I don't think it would be useful in a combat situation. There's one last step to take. I looked at my overland map and saw that, with the companions moving east by boat and with Romola and Suro moving west on foot, the two groups would meet almost exactly where the companions come ashore. That was fortuitous, but it has implications, namely that neither side has time to prepare an optimal list of memorized spells. For Romola and Suro, I am therefore going to roll them at random and say that's what they had when they departed and that there is no time to replace them with anything more suitable. And once again, I'll do these off mic. Okay, I'm back. Romola is going to have the following. Glamour. Detect Illusion times 2. Blur. Whispering Wind times 2. Paralyzation. Suggestion. Rainbow Pattern. Veil of Abandonment. You know, that could have been worse, for the PCs that is, but I think Romola has become a pretty tough customer on her own. Depending what happens with Suro in the next episode, the companions are going to be in for a tough fight. One thing they'll have to their advantage is this. The Illusionist and the Warlock need to hurry. They will not have the luxury of preparing anything like an ambush, nor will they be able to recruit any help. Basically, these two sides are going to clash, and the dice will tell us what happens when they do. But we are out of time, and we'll have to wait until the next episode. Until then. 
Thank you for listening to Tale of the Manticore. I have a special kind of announcement to make today. As I type this, it's morning on Wednesday, January 3rd of 2024. I am proud and grateful to tell you that last night, the podcast surpassed the one half million downloads milestone. When I started this weird little experiment in fiction, I had no idea it could ever find such an audience. For all of you who have listened, participated in, and championed the show, I just want to say thank you very, very much. A half million is a number too big for me to parse. It's just mind-blowing, and, I have to be honest, extremely gratifying. To my voice actors, I owe a world of thanks. This episode features three great talents, including a new one. Playing Bazu is, as always, Andrew Fling of Tumble Die Games. James Schrall of the excellent solo play Subclass Act podcast returns in the role of Schrall, the head of the Church Thieves Guild. And taking on Torum, the new NPC and the PC's guide, I'd like to welcome Ben of Pink Fohawk to the cast. Pink Fohawk is an any nominated actual play podcast set in the Shadowrun universe. Highly recommended. Thanks very much, Andrew, James, and Ben. If there's anyone out there who would like to get in touch with me, I am at Manticore Tale on X or Tale of the Manticore Podcast on Instagram. If you prefer email, it's taleofthemanticore at gmail.com. Finally, I keep a blog where I post all kinds of show and RPG-related stuff. Recently, I've given myself a challenge I've called the 12 Days of Kit Bash, and I've been making just dozens of minis. By the time this episode airs, that should be up on the blog, if you're curious. Of course, you can also find some maps, tables, crafts, and show notes. It's at taleofthemanticore.blogspot.com. The adventure will continue on the next episode of Tale of the Manticore. The story where chaos rolls. Come with us, dear viewers, on a journey full of horror, humor, and mystery to the Regency village of Bledlow, where three young ladies are about to discover nothing is quite as they believed. You can follow along on YouTube and Twitch every other week if they survive. My mother likes to be sure that we are always very presentable. In Kamtaria. Yeah. In her underwear. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about somebody's silly hat, I mean, Edwin's right next to you. I do miss you terribly when you go away. I, you know, I'll be home soon. I promise. This is quite disturbing. Why would he have such unholy books? Have you come for my, my power? power? Some sorrow, some sorrow, some sorrow.